Right, well, thank you very much for the, uh, for the introduction. I sort of sit at the back of the room sometimes and cringe a little bit because I'm actually a normal type of person. And that's what I want to start off by saying. I have a regular full-time job. I'm an uh, airline pilot with Air New Zealand. And I'm very proud to fly for Air New Zealand. It's our national carrier. I fly the, uh, the French Wonder, the Airbus, uh, around the Pacific Islands, uh, across to Australia, and up and down the country as well. Uh, I have a great family. Uh, my wife is pretty awesome. And I'll talk a little bit about her. My kids are great as well, but they're just normal. I mean, they weren't great this morning when I was trying to get them to school and they knew I was, uh, had to be somewhere. But something people don't know about me is I don't like heights. And my kids think it's hilarious because Dad squealed on the roller coaster when I took him to Disneyland a couple of years ago, but then Dad managed to climb Mount Everest. And that's the thing about me, is I've been blessed with this ability to overcome some huge challenges to achieve some really cool things. And that's what I want to talk to you about today and share with you how I go about doing it. It comes down to three core principles that I apply over and over again. Now, this isn't a talk about how to climb Everest. It really isn't. I want to make sure that you know that. And I'm hoping that with some of my ideas, you'll draw parallels in your own lives with what you do, both professionally and personally as well. And I apply these principles whether it's taking my kids on an adventure or whether it's actually going to Everest as well. And it comes down to three things. The first one is I give myself permission to dream. That sounds too simple, but the more I dream, the more refined my ideas become, and then I find what I'm passionate about. And finding that passion is one of the hardest things, but it's one of the most rewarding things when you, when you actually find it. And if you want to achieve anything that seems impossible or super hard, actually spending that time and taking that time to get the, the dream part down is the most important part, then you can set your goals. You know when you're passionate about it because you wake up in the morning thinking about what you want to do and you go to bed thinking about it as well and it's, um, it, it's always in your thoughts. Once I know that, I go to the second step and I get myself a plan, a strong plan that I break into parts that, and smaller and smaller and smaller parts and I used to do it on a, on a piece of paper or on a board, now I do it on my iPad on a mind map and I'd break them down to big size chunks like for example, Everest, I break down to you know, family, uh, how I'm going to manage uh, that, uh, finances, but there'll be courage and inspiration and motivation in there as well. And I'll break those down to further parts so that when I get overwhelmed, and every single person gets overwhelmed, and I do, all the time, I've actually got a plan for it and I can simply take these tiny steps and then I find this magic thing called momentum. And that's such a big key as well and I'll talk a bit about that later on. And the last thing, and the most important thing is I just never, ever, ever give up. If I don't give up, I can't fail because I'm always going towards what I want to do. So how did it all begin? Well, I was a young man. I was about, uh, or a young kid. I was probably 11 or 12. And I saw Air New Zealand's uh, 747-200 flying over my school in about 19, uh, sort of 90 or 91. And for some reason, I wanted to be an airline pilot. And I just really, really, that was my dream. You know, I'd go to bed thinking about it. I'd wake up thinking about it. Only problem was, I was very, very average at school. Like, I'm talking, I would probably get 46%, 50% of us lucky in most of my exams. And to be an airline pilot, believe it or not, you do have to have a bit of intelligence. So I went along and I found, I came up with a plan, and I found this kid, and he was the smartest kid in the whole school. His name was Chris. And I looked at Chris and I said to him, how long are you going to study for on Friday for the exam? And Chris said, 20 minutes. I thought, choice, that's me. <laughs> I went home, studied for 20 minutes. You can all see where it's going to go. And I turned up for the exam and really confident because I'd done the same study as Chris and I failed miserably. I got 46%. He got 93. That made me really mad because I was really passionate about this, this uh, becoming a pilot. So I went home and for the next exam, we had another mass exam in two weeks, I studied for four hours. Chris did his 20 minutes and I was really nervous and I sat the exam and I topped the class, I got 97%. And from that day on, I worked out, it wasn't how brainy I was, it was how hard I was prepared to try. And I just started trying harder than the next person. Got really good grades in school and did really well. Uh, went to university and then got a job with a little company called Great Barrier Airlines flying out to the barrier. That's where I got most of my um, flying experience. And uh, we've got some pretty good experiences there, I tell you. I've got a story later on to tell you about, about what happened there. Um, Cut a long story short, I got into Air New Zealand at age 26 as an airline pilot, and I was on a 747-400. Um, we used to call it Daddy's Yacht, and we used to fly to London, um, Japan, uh, LA. It was fantastic. I was having a great time. After a couple of years, 
I couldn't put my finger on it. I was lost. Loved my job, loved my life, but I didn't have this passion. <laughs> is, that a, is that a fine or something? <laughs> so I couldn't, I didn't, I loved what I was doing. Absolutely loved it. But, and I couldn't put my finger on what was wrong with me. And then I worked out I didn't have any goals. I'd achieved this lifetime goal of becoming an airline pilot. So I thought, right, I know how to achieve things, no problem at all. And I started pulling random goals out of the air, like I was going to run a marathon. And I failed. Didn't even get to the start line. So I thought, that's a bit weird, a bit, a bit strange. I think I actually enrolled in a marathon and never made it. So the next thing I thought, oh, right, I'm going to do the coast to coast, get to set a bigger goal. I never did that as well, I failed. And it wasn't until I took a huge step back and realized I wasn't passionate about those things. I didn't care about those things. And so I started just dreaming, just letting myself dream. And the way I did it in those days is I just read heaps and heaps of books. And the more and more books I read, the more sort of refined my ideas would become. And then I sort of found my way to sort of adventure and then to climbing and mountaineering. I read all of Hemingway's books. And Ernest Hemingway is a great American writer. Um, some of them were completely boring. Some of them were great. And he was into adventure, and he would go and run with the bulls, for example. So I thought, that's a cool idea. So I ran with the bulls. Got home and uh, read the next book and realized he hadn't run with the bulls. He had just washed. But anyway, it was leading me down this. <laughs> so you've got to be careful sometimes. But it was leading me down this path to having great adventures. And so I, and I finally fell in love with mountaineering and really fell in love with it, but mainly reading the books. So I rang a company called Aspiring Guides in uh, Wanaka and uh, enrolled in their advanced mountaineering course, and I turned up there. I'd set my dream of climbing Everest, but I was too embarrassed to tell anybody. And when I got to uh, the South Island, to Wanaka, and you can imagine what, what they thought of the Aucklander turning up, um, wanting to learn to climb with no experience. But they were really nice to me, and they turned me into a really good, competent, strong mountaineer. And after eight years of climbing all over the world, I had enough experience to attempt to climb Mount Everest unguided. And I've got a little video to show you.
So this is what Everest looks like from, uh, from the bottom. And so like I said, I wanted to go uh, unguided um, and climb it on my own. It sounds a bit strange, but to tell the truth, I actually didn't have the funding to go, uh, to go guided in one of the big companies. So I found a chap, his name was Henry Todd. He's quite controversial, he's a, but he's a really good fella, uh, who would manage me at base camp. And he'd provide me with all the camps the whole way through, uh, but I had to carry all of my own uh, gear and on most of the camps, all of my own food, except for Camp 2, where there was a kitchen. Uh, but most importantly, on summit day, he would give me a Sherpa that would carry uh, two bottles of spare option for me, and he'd follow me uh, to the summit, or, to, or at least to the south summit. So you can't go straight to the top. You have to go through the icefall up to Camp 1, and then you come down and you rest, and that's the first cycle. And then you go all the way through again to Camp 2, and then back down, and then you rest for about a week. And then finally, you do a third cycle up to Camp 3, through the camps up to Camp 3, and then back down. So this is why it takes so long to climb Everest. It's about an average of 100 days. Now, the most dangerous part is around Camp 1 there. You can see it with the, uh, the Kumbu Icefall. And on your left-hand side, there's a very large triangular shoulder. That's called the western shoulder of Everest. And that avalanche is pretty much every day across the Icefall as well. So not only have you got this frozen river creaking and groaning and collapsing um, and imploding as well, you've got this, this avalanche issue. And that's what hurt the Sherpas back in 2014 when uh, 14 of them got, uh, got killed on the, on the mountain. So before you go into the mountain, you have to have a blessing. You have two blessings. First one's from this chap. His name's Lama Gershi, and he lives down the valley a little bit. And I spent a bit of time with this man, and he's sort of like the Dalai Lama of the area, and he's the head, head teaching Lama. And he said something to me that's stuck with me forever. He goes, Mike, if everyone in this world just gave a little bit more than they take, the world's a much better place. And I really like that. So I go around and I give my time free of charge to schools, especially high schools, because they're a very difficult audience. Um, but other little interesting um, charitable things as well. So this monk here, uh, he in his monastery, he had a yeti skull and a yeti hand, original artifacts. Now the yeti is an abominable snowman that lives in the mountains up in the Himalayas. I don't know if I believe that it's a, an abominable snowman, but there's something in the mountains that scares the Sherpas. Um, but they had these old artifacts. It was a hand and a skull. And in the late 1990s, uh, so the early 90s, uh, they got stolen. And when they got stolen, they took this guy's little income away and the rest of his monks as well, and they had no income because no, no tourists would go and visit. So I managed to get uh, wetter workshops to um, build some replicas uh, some, of some very old historic photographs, and I took them back up to him. It took me ages to convince him that they weren't the real artifacts because um, he was quite suspicious. Um, but he was a really nice man as well, and he walked, probably a couple of months later, he walked out of the mountains for uh, about four days to find an email, and he sent me this email, and he said, Dear Mr. Mike, thank you so much. You are very kind to our monastery and our small community. Uh, it's working. Tourists are coming up to see us. But we have another problem. We have some wild Tibetans, and they've come across the Himalayas, and they've destroyed one of our stupas, which is this big statue. Um, would you help us? We need 650 kilos of cement. Well, the nearest road is 350 miles away. But he wrote on the bottom of it the best sales line he's ever, I've ever read, and you feel free to use it if you want. He wrote down the bottom, he said, if you help us, you will have a good next life. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I wrote to all my friends and said, I'm selling bags of cement. They're 100 US dollars a bag. Um, and uh, if you buy one, you get a good next life. And I sold out within a day. And he managed to get his, his, um, his statue made. So up to base camp, now this is the traditional blessing that you see on, on the movies where we, well it's called a puja, where we throw um, barley flour at each other and have this blessing all day. But that lama was busy, and he was busy for about five days. So we decided after a couple of days of getting itchy feet that we would go into the ice fall, but we wouldn't sleep on the mountain, which is a, not a very good idea. I got to this point, and right in the middle here is people, on this side, some people here. And when I got here, this was just crazy climbing. You know, we don't climb like this in the Southern Alps or the French Alps. You know, you just don't take that sort of risk. But on Everest, you take these really, really unnecessary risks or necessary risks. But the, we weren't going fast to Camp 1. We were just milling around having a look. And I think this probably creaked and groaned a bit much when I got to this point. So I turned around and I came back. And there was a very flat area called the football field. And I remember started wa I started walking across it and I heard this huge whoomph, and I knew exactly what it was. There was a huge serac had peeled off the western shoulder um, of Everest and was coming straight for us and formed this ginormous avalanche. Uh, it's probably about 200 metres wide. 
And so I had two choices. I could unclip from the safety lines and run and try and jump the crevasses, or I could stand and take my fate. So I, I chose to run, so I unclipped and I ran and I managed to get across all these crevasses. And then right at the last minute, I remember turning around and looking at this thing coming towards us and everywhere shaking, there's people screaming, you know, the ground shaking beneath you. And I was trying to decide whether to jump into a crevasse to get away from the shock wave, and I actually froze, I didn't, I didn't know what to do. And right at that particular moment, the avalanche hit a ridge and the energy dissipated upwards and then it just came down and dusted on top of us. And for some very strange reason, I honestly don't know why to this day, I managed to take a photograph. You can see the size of it because there's some people here. At this side. Let's see if I can get in here, uh, over there. And so, yeah, probably two or three hundred meters wide. I came back down and I sat in base camp and I said, I'm going nowhere until I get a blessing. And I waited another three days for the, um, for the uh, Lama to turn up. Once we got that all the way through the ice, ice fall, and it's not a very nice place, I'll tell you that now, it's, it really isn't. And then we went to Camp 1. We were too scared to come down because it was too active, so we hardened up and we, we said we'll go to Camp 2. Now, this is the Western Coom of Everest, and I felt incredibly humbled to be walking there because literally 50 or 60 years ago, no one had ever walked in this part of the world. And you know, you're walking in the footsteps of Sir Edmund. It was just, it was a pretty humbling experience. Um, also incredibly inhospitable. A friend of mine was walking with his mouth exposed, and it's at 20,000 feet or 21,000 feet, and it's minus 30-ish, but the reflective heat of the snow actually burnt the roof of his tongue and burnt his tongue so badly that it swelled up and it blistered at, at night. So it's a very, very harsh, harsh environment. So from there, up to Camp 2, we stayed for a couple of days, uh, back down to base camp, rested again, then all the way through the mountains, uh, sorry, through the camps again to Camp 3. And then you come down, and then you go down the valley and you wait, because there's only about uh, probably 10 to 12 days a year that you can actually climb Everest. And that's when the jet streams, which are the really strong winds across that continent, move north, and then you hopefully punch up, touch the summit, and come back down. Now, you can't actually um, uh, wait for a good weather window. You've got to climb on a forecast, because it takes so long to get up there. So we were waiting for a really good forecast. So we spent a lot of time in this little village. It's called Pangbache. And we sort of ate every single chicken we saw. We tried to put on as much weight um, as we could. I read that book into thin air, which is a really silly idea because we were just about to go and do what those guys had done. Um, but I remember being a little bit scared there as well. And a, a really good friend of mine said, Mike, are you visualizing? And I said, yeah, of course I am. And she was a really good triathlete. And she said to me, she goes, Mike, what I want you to do, she goes, is I want you to visualize yourself having issues, you know, dealing with yourself when everything's going fine, it's really easy. She goes, I want you to deal with three main issues that you're really scared about, and I want you to visualize those happening. And then, so what I do is I sit there nice and quietly, and then as I think about these three things, and one was getting lost on the mountain on my own, because I was climbing on my own in a, in a whiteout. The second one was um, friends of mine um, getting lost or, or getting hurt. And the last one was uh, avalanches, um, you know, near misses or getting caught in an avalanche. So I'd think about these things until I could feel the emotion sort of welling up inside me, just as you can feel tears coming into your eyes, I'd change the way I was thinking, and it's disruptive thinking, and I'd change it, and I would visualize myself handling each situation in a really good manner. And what it did is it was tricking my subconscious into already dealing with some of those issues, so that when I got lost in a whiteout, I didn't actually panic, because I'd already dealt with it at some stage. It was a very, very powerful trick. But um, the time came when we went back up, um, took us two days to get to base camp, and we were climbing on a forecast, so the winds were still there, and you could hear these winds. It was like a freight train, it really was, just roaring away at about 200 knots, about 400 kilometers an hour, and then we were hoping as we climbed up the mountain they would dissipate. And so we went camp one, camp two, up to camp three for a night, and then you can see this uh, yellow band here. Now this is, used to sit on the seabed. Uh, and when India collided with Asia and pushed the Himalayas into the, into the sky, uh, this has been lifted up to 25,000 feet. And people have actually found little fossils and little fish and uh, little shells inside this, um, this yellow band. I was too tired to look for fossils. I just took a photograph. That was about it. <laughs> so finally you get to Camp 4. Now Camp 4 is uh, 26,000 feet. The partial pressure of oxygen is so low uh, that it won't actually go into your lungs. So basically, there's no pressure to push the, the atmosphere into your lungs. So you're on oxygen 100% of the time. And it makes a little difference. It reduces the altitude by only about 3,000 feet. But everything's in slow motion. 
and you feel like the worst hangover in your entire world um, is happening to you at the time. And so when I say in slow motion, it takes you half an hour to get one boot on. You get this boot on, and you're really proud of it, and then you look down, and it's on the wrong foot. <laughs> <laughs> and you actually see a lot of high-altitude climbers walking around with LMR written on their boots. I also remember being really scared in that photograph too because I had a really cool wife at home with three really young kids under five, and this is a bit crazy you know, to be doing this. And I remember thinking to myself, um, I just wanted to come home at that stage because I was really scared. And I remember thinking in four or five years' time, I'm going to convince myself it's another good idea and I'll be back. So the safest thing was for me to go to the summit and back. I also remember thinking about my mistakes, and some of the, my best lessons are my own mistakes in my life. They really are, so I don't know whether I can call them mistakes. But they don't have to be your mistakes. They can be other people's. So what I did is I read every book on Everest, and I wrote in the back why people fail. And the number one reason that people fail is because of punctuality. It's so hard to get ready. If you're supposed to be ready at 11 o'clock and you're not ready to 12 or 1, then you've got no chance. Or rushing themselves and actually um, forgetting something. So being a typical pilot, I had a checklist that I'd, I'd check off. The other thing I had was a bit of a, um, a conscious dilemma. There was two mountaineers next to us that were going and climbing without oxygen. Now, the statistics are 68 people try, one makes it, and 67 get rescued by guys like me that have one shot. So I knew before I left that I couldn't walk past anybody without and just go to the summit, um, that I'd have to help. Uh, and I, I knew that already, and that was fine. So what I did is I went to see these chaps, and they were Spanish, and I said, hey, when are you boys leaving? And they said, 8 o'clock. Uh, we were leaving at midnight, so then I came back, grabbed the, um, the Sherpa, and said, hey, we'll leave at 9. So as I walked past them, I said, are you guys all right? And they gave me the thumbs up and they said, yeah, we're fine. And we carried on going to the summit. And I think they got rescued probably a couple of hours later, to tell the truth. So we, anyway, uh, night time comes, 9 o'clock came, and there's this little shake on the tent. And this little voice and uh, said, Mikey, let's go. And I, I remember coming out of the tent and I stood up. And as I stood up, this guy came up to about here on me. And his name was Lakpa. And he was 20 years of age. He was the most inexperienced Sherpa on the mountain. He'd only climbed Everest once and they were matching strong clients with inexperienced Sherpas and, and vice versa. And he looked at me and he said, come on, Mikey, let's go tonight. We're going to climb Everest. I remember the butterflies. You know, I really do. And we started walking, and it's very, very flat, and then it gets really steep really quickly. And you kick your foot in, you hit your axe, and you stand up, and then that's it. You're completely exhausted. If someone said, I'll pay you $10,000 to take another step, you pass out. And you recover, and then you kick your foot in again, hit your axe, stand up. And this goes on all night. And I got myself in quite a good rhythm. We passed the Spanish guys, and, and I knew they were OK, so my conscience was clear. And we carried on a bit. And I remember sort of looking down, and it was really steep. And there's a few little lights below me and a few little lights above. And then something at the corner of my eye, probably 10 feet away, caught my attention. And I looked over, and it was this chap. And he was sitting on a rock. And he'd been there for 10 years. He had his bag over his head. And I remember looking at him, and I knew who he was. So I just read about him. It was Scott Fisher. And it really upset me. It really did, because this man had a, a, you know, a wife and a, and a mum and a dad and brothers and sisters, and here am I walking past him. And the other thing is he was an amazing mountaineer. He had climbed Everest twice without oxygen. He would climbed it another two or three times guiding it. And here am I walking past him. And I was nowhere near in his league, and it really upset me. So I didn't look, and I just kept saying to myself, and almost panicking, just take one step, Mike, just one step. And I took the step. Stood up, I never looked back at him, and then I took another one, and I found this momentum, and then off I went. Pretty soon the dawn comes up, and you're waiting for that sun. I mean, it's minus 55 degrees, sort of at night time when you're climbing, and the sun comes up, and it goes to minus 50. Um, but psychologically, point of view, it's really, it really makes a huge difference. I'm right in the centre there. You can see me uh, just here. Luck was behind me. And this is the knife edge ridge. This is the hardest part of the climb. You've got to be really careful. On your right, it's about an 8,500 foot drop. On the left, it's about a 6,000 foot drop. So if you're going to drop off or fall off, you know you have to go left, which is the most important thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, the, the right in the centre of those rocks, that's the Hillary Step. And there's all this hoo-ha about the Hillary Step disappeared a little while ago. Well, some snow melted and it's turned up again. Um, so I flew along the ridge, I could climb really well, got up the Hillary step, and I've got some footage of a friend of mine standing on that big rock, filming downwards. I'll show you. This is Ward on the Hillary step. 
You have an idea of the exposure? That's the short side. So it's a bit. Okay. The ball. Well done, mate. Keep coming. Lots of old ropes from previous expeditions. You can hope you got the right one. Grab onto the whole bundle. Well done, Ward. Excellent. Okay, I'm gonna to have to say goodbye now, but congrats. Thank you. So I flew along the ridge up the Hillary Steep, and there's a little steep part just above the rock, and then it sort of flattens out, and uh, Lakpa was um, still at the bottom of the step waiting for people to come down. I think he was a friend he was talking to. And I started walking along, and, and it's, it was quite shallow, and I knew that the summit of Everest was just around the corner, and we'd crossed the last hurdle. And I remember thinking, wow, you're, you're going to summit Everest. And the sooner had I thought it, I started to get really disorientated and, and I started to stagger. And then my left leg collapsed and I sort of fell into the snow. And then I sort of slumped down, sort of drifting in and out of consciousness. And I remember turning around and I'm sitting right underneath the, um, those rocks at the top there, consciously thinking, I'm about to vanish. 40 people have vanished on that ridge and I'm about to, to vanish as well. And then luck turned up and he knew exactly what had happened. I'd actually run out of oxygen. And he changed my bottle and he actually saved my life. And if it wasn't for him, I'd still be sitting there today. As soon as that auction hit you, it's absolutely an amazing feeling. I came around the corner and I saw that summit. And I remember tears welling up in my eyes thinking, you have worked so hard for this, Mike. There's no amount of money can buy that summit. And I remember a tear sort of trickled down underneath my goggle. And then something clicked. And I like to think it's my pilot brain because um, there was no space for emotion, it's way too dangerous for a start. And if you, if you cry on Everest, your eyeballs are going to freeze. So I turned to Lakpa and I said, uh, we're going to take three photographs, one phone call and we're gone. And then I took the last couple of steps and then stood on the summit. I really like this photo because um, I'm really scared behind those goggles and I'm really humbled to be standing there as well. And people say to me, Mike, you conquered Everest. And I would really find that funny because I didn't conquer Everest. Everest allowed me to stand there for a couple of minutes, uh, and I escaped with my fingers, my toes, and actually my life. And the saying I liked the best is Sir Edmund Hillary said, the only thing we conquered was ourselves, and I really like that. The other thing I like about that is those is the little tiny kuru that I've got on my, um, on my suit there. That was a big decision for the airline to allow me to use that because I could be still on the Everest with people taking photographs of it. Um, so they allowed me to, and that represented my friends and my colleagues that stood behind me when I went there. I didn't tell anyone I was going except my closest friends and a couple of my managers because I was afraid that I was going to fail. And that's a tragedy. I'm going to talk about that in a, in a minute. The other thing I like about that is those boots. I turned up to Everest and I ran out of money. I had no boots and I had 500 bucks left. And to buy a decent pair of boots in Kathmandu is $500. And, but I wanted to give that to my Sherpa as a tip. So I was going to wing it. I just think it's quite a funny uh, Kiwi thing to do. You turn up to Everest with no money, no boots, uh, and then you're still going to make the summit. So on the way down, um, there's another, uh, we had, you know, coming down is probably the most dangerous part, and you can't abseil backwards the whole way down Everest because you, it takes too long. So you have to clip into the rope with the carabiner, and then you wrap your arm around the rope, and you lean forward, and you basically arm wrap down like the SAS do. And the, the balance is getting that balance right. You know, that's the really hard thing, especially when you, you're not uh, functioning properly. And I got to a really steep part, and I looked in the distance, and along the ridge was disappearing um, this yellow climbing suit, which was Lakpa. And he had one more bottle of oxygen with him, or half a bottle. And I remember panic welling up, and so I clipped into the line, grabbed hold of the rope, and leant forward, and then fell. And as I fell, I managed to grab hold of another line, and I stopped, and I was sort of swinging in midair. Two other Sherpas from another team came down, and, and I put myself up, and they asked me if I was okay. And I clipped myself in, and I was, I was off to Tibet. It was that close. And I clipped myself in, and I'm abseiling backwards, and I'm looking at my shoulder, looking at this little figure just disappearing real fast along the ridge. And I couldn't understand it. It didn't make sense. And I got to the bottom of the slope, and I sort of staggered around the corner, really despondent, and there's Lakpa waiting for me. He would have never left me. It was someone else in a yellow suit. And that was the nearest miss, miss that I had. The other thing I was doing as well is the subconscious mind. 
Now, the conscious mind is the part that beats our heart and you cut yourself, it heals it. You know, that's the conscious mind. The subconscious mind um, is 200 million times, or they can't even put a figure on it, than the actual conscious mind. So I'd been telling myself over and over again that I was going to go from camp four all the way to the summit and then all the way down to base camp. It's completely impossible. But the thing about the subconscious mind is it doesn't know the difference between fantasy and reality. So I got to the summit. I had heaps of energy left because subconsciously my mind thought I was going down to the, um, down to the base camp. And the Navy SEALs, the American Navy SEALs, they have a saying that when you're completely spent, completely exhausted, and you can't even take another step, you're only 30% done. You've got another 70% on your tank, or some similar figures to that. So I'd been telling myself over and over again that I was going to go to base camp. So when I got to camp four, I had heaps of energy, because I was also scared, because a lot of people died from exhaustion that night. And I was really lucky, because my um, colleague turned up, who I'd made friends with, and he had done a really good job of freezing his toes. Now, the only reason he froze his toes is because he didn't do the basics. We were all climbing independently, and he hadn't um, kept up his fluid intake because it's so hard to manage water on Everest because it freezes in seconds. So basically, the blood flow around his toes got um, really badly. Um, uh, sorry, real. His blood was all congealed and, and sludgy, obviously. And this is really great science because we're made up in our muscles and our cells of about 60 to 70% water. And when you freeze water, it expands. So it's killed his as the cells in his toes. It got a little worse, and then finally he got it wiped off. Those are great photos after lunch, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> no offense to anyone that's English, but he's English. And every time, I've just seen him in, uh, in England a couple of months ago, and every time he has, um, uh, by the third pint, his toe always comes out in the pub. It's quite funny. <laughs> So like my wife's my rock, she really is, and she flew up to Kathmandu to bring me home, and she married me knowing I was an adventurer, and she's never tried to change me. She married, we had kids knowing that I was gonna go to Everest at some stage, and I was really excited because I had a job offer on Everest the next year, and I said to her, I said, hey, I've got this job offer, you know, I can climb and actually get paid, and she said to me the smartest thing anyone's ever said to this date. She goes, Mike, if you need to climb Everest again, don't worry, we will find a way. She didn't mean it at all. <laughs> but what she was doing was giving me space to work out myself that my kids need a dad more than I need to go and climb Everest. And that when I took a huge step back, it actually wasn't the mountain, it was the relationships with, those, with the Sherpas and the climbers and my, my colleagues on the mountain as well that was the most important thing to me. The human relationships was the most important. So with her blessing, every time one of my kids turns seven, uh, I'd take them to see Everest. Uh, we'd trek 150 kilometers, just one-on-one -on -one with Dad. You can't drag a seven-year-old that far. They have to walk. And we just take one village at a time. And it's, well, I've taken all three now. It's absolutely magic seeing their interactions with the, um, with the Sherpa people. It really is. Uh, we've been back as a family. And so uh, when they all turned seven, that was their thing they did with Dad. And when they turned 14, they have another family tradition where they get to choose an adventure. Uh, and it has to have a couple of elements. It has to be what outside their limits of what they think is possible. It has to be safe. It has to have Wendy's approval, obviously. And the last one uh, has to be good for the community, or a community. So my little girl, she's seven in that picture, she's just turned 13, uh, she came to me and said, oh, Dad, I want to go to Everest Base Camp. And we came up with this idea that we would take two paddle boards to Everest Base Camp and we would, or she would paddle the world's highest lake, which is just next to Everest. So we'd just done it in November and uh, we had a lot of safety around it um, for anyone that's sort of wondering. We had a doctor and we had rescue boards, this sort of stuff, and she had a dry suit on. We sort of pushed her out into the uh, middle of this lake and she paddled the, uh, a lake at 18 and a half thousand feet. She also um, raised some money. We raised some money for, there's um, some old widows that live up in the um, Himalayas and there's nine of them in this little village and they've lost their husbands, their fathers, and all of their sons on Everest. And we've slowly been re-roofing their homes for them as well. So that was her little project. So going back to after I'd finished Everest, I had to find another way of coming up with an adventure. Adventure's in my blood. It's really what, what drives me and I really enjoy. But it had to be something as serious as Mount Everest without the risk of getting myself killed or being away from my family for so long. So I went back to step one. I just let myself dream making sure I was going to be passionate about it. It took quite a while. I read lots and lots of books, and finally I read a book by Sir Randolph Fiennes, and he was the first guy ever to run seven marathons in seven days on seven continents. And I read that paragraph, and I went, that's me. I'd never run a marathon in my life, not even half a marathon in my life. And so I got myself a, um, 
a plan, broke it down into parts. I had you know, finance, um, courage, inspiration, family, had the logistics, how I was going to do it, and one of them was how to learn to run. And then I broke that down into smaller and smaller parts. My hero when I was growing up, oh, sorry, I got a website and a logo. Uh, my hero when I was growing up was this chap, Rod Dixon. He won the 1983 New York Marathon. Uh, and then I went out for a run. And I ran five kilometers, and everything fell apart. My knees hurt, my feet hurt, my back hurt. I couldn't run. Running had gone from being Rod Dixon to the guy lying on the ground uh, in my mind. But it didn't worry me. Because I had this plan, I came back, and I simply went to the smallest part, which was to learn to run. And I typed into YouTube how to run properly. And pretty soon, I turned into a really good runner. I could run good distances. It wasn't very fast, but I could do it without injuring myself. And, but the other thing I wanted to do was to run for a cause greater than oneself, to give more than I take. So I went to Kids Can New Zealand, which is a really awesome New Zealand charity, helping underprivileged New Zealand children. And I'll be raising money and awareness for them. Now, I just want to make this little point. You can imagine how, how scary it was to put yourself out there and to find that courage and not be afraid to actually tell people that you were doing this. This is probably one of the hardest things. And this is this fear of failure I want to talk about in, in a couple of minutes. So the idea was seven marathons, seven days on seven continents. <laughs> Two point two. You done it? Finished. Mate, four, four down, three to go. Yeah, you're over the hump. Well over the hump, I guess. Superstar. About 13 kilometers into six marathon and six days and six continents. It's tough. That's what it's tough. Falkland Islands. Has anybody been to the Falklands or from the Falklands? It's an awesome place. Like There's one flight a week, so you have to wait there a week so you get to know the locals. And the locals are really nice. As soon as they find out you're not Argentinian, they're, they're really nice. Um, and the uh, Governor General invited me to his house to come and have a cup of tea on the Queen. And he said to me, he's a runner as well, he said, whatever you do, don't run off the road because there's lots of mines everywhere. And it's quite dangerous. So I ran along, started my stopwatch, and I ran. And it's just a spectacular place, it really is. And this beautiful bird started circling around me. And then, you know, then there was three and five, and you know, four and a half, five hours later, when I finished the marathon, there was a whole flock of them. And I stopped to do my shoelace up, and one landed next to me, and it was a vulture. And these things were waiting for me to fall over so they have, a, have their feed. I made a bit of a mistake. I hopped in an ice bath, and the ice water uh, in New Zealand, when you run the tap and put a, a bag of ice in, is about eight to 10 degrees. Uh, up there that comes out of tap at that temperature. So um, I managed to freeze everything because I was just doing it on my stopwatch. Uh, it took a while to thaw out. It was a bit painful. But then I got on the aeroplane, and being a typical Kiwi, I didn't actually have the funds to go business class everywhere. Um, so Air New Zealand were fantastic. They gave me business class on their aircraft, but that was only two sectors out of the, out of the 10 or 12 I had to do. Um, so sitting in economy with my legs bent, my quads cooled and they shortened. So that when I came to run the next marathon, they wouldn't stretch back into the proper place. So I gave myself classic runner's knee. So I'm in Chile, in Santiago, on the outskirts of the main city, and I'm running along at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm on my own. There's no one there. Um, and there was about 150 dogs following me like the Pied Piper. And my knee went. And I remember sitting on the ground on the curb, crying, 3 o'clock in the morning, with these dogs looking at me, going, what am I going to do? I can't, even, I can't even do one and a half. I've told the whole world I'm going to do seven. And then my phone beeped. And it was a lady from, uh, I think she was from America, and she just thanked me for the inspiration and said that she was running and walking every day that I was doing it. And, a, and another, someone else uh, texted me as well. And then I stood up, I thought, I'm just going to go to the next power pole. And I ran to the next power pole, and I finished that marathon just by focusing on the next power poles, and off I went. 
got back, hopped on an airplane up to Los Angeles. I had really good support there. Um, that team ran off and got a strap from the knee. About 10 minutes later, the other one went, so um, I strapped that one up as well. Straight on the aircraft to London, uh, where a physio met me off the airplane and checked my knees, and he said, look, you're not doing any permanent damage, but there's a lot of swelling and a lot of fluid. It's going to hurt. And I remember thinking, you know, pain's temporary. Giving up is, is forever. And if I have to do the last couple on my crutches, and they take 10 hours, so be it. Might raise more money for the charity. And I carried on. Down to Morocco, uh, then over to Hong Kong. And so I came down uh, the stairs in the Hong Kong um, hotel, and I'm sponsored by a, a big uh, North American health science company. And they had a lot of associates there. And I'd forgotten to do what's called a power pose. Has anyone heard of these power poses? No? Well, there's, there's, I'm a pilot, so I believe in, you know, you put uh, uh, jet fuel into the aircraft and it turns into thrust. So I, I believe in science. So this power pose has been developed by a lady called Professor Amy Cuddy, and she's got a TED talk about it. And what she talks about is actually standing in front of the mirror with your arms up above your head in Superman pose, and you stare at yourself for two minutes. Don't do it in front of anyone else because you feel really stupid. Or put your hands on your hips, and it's called the Wonder Woman pose. And you just stare at yourself for two minutes, thinking whatever you want. But what it does is it spikes your testosterone, and it kills your cortisol, which is your stress hormone. And so she took 100 people, and she took 50. Um, they must have been going for military jobs. She put 50 through the power pose technique, and basically that's it. And all 50 got through to the next round. Out of the 50 that she didn't teach, only five got through. It was a 90% failure rate. So it's a really powerful technique. So I stood there for a couple of minutes back in my hotel room, feeling pretty stupid. Um, but the next 35 kilometers went perfectly. It was just amazing. The last ones were a bit of a, bit of a challenge. Anyway, we got back to New Zealand. Ran the last 200, uh, sorry, the 4Ks with 200 of my friends and the last kilometre just with my kids and crossed the finish line. We raised $75,000 for Kids Can as a public figure. Um, but you can imagine how many times I got overwhelmed. The thought of running a marathon uh, when you've just, another one, when you've just finished one, let alone getting on an aircraft, was just too overwhelming right, for anybody. So I would just, wouldn't focus on it. I'd simply focus on that moment, and whether it was eating my nutrition or putting on my skins or whatever, drinking, and then I would always find this thing called momentum, and then off I'd go. The other thing I want to talk about is I made the classic Kiwi mistake. I was afraid to fail. You know, on Everest, I didn't tell anyone I was going to go because I was scared. I was really terrified um, here about letting everybody down and failing. And so what I did is I overtrained. I went to Everest, and I was guiding people to base camp, and I wanted to see how strong I was because we had a saying on Everest that you only know how strong you are when strong is your only option. And on Everest, you've only got one option is to be strong or you're dead. So I wanted to find it in a controlled way. So I climbed up a mountain next to Everest, a trekking peak called Kalabatar, and I took my team up there. And then I started the world's highest marathon. It's 18,500 feet. No one's ever run a higher one since. And I just did it with my Sherpas, and they would meet me along the way. Cut a long story short, I managed to get myself lost, met the team, got back to Kathmandu. Wendy had come up with my little girl, and I, I took her into the mountains for another two weeks. And carrying that backpack after running so many marathons and overtraining, I put a stress fracture on my spine, on my lower spine. So I got home, and I had uh, two weeks to go, and it was my first attempt at the 777 run, and I had to put it all off. And I was devastated. You know, I lost $16,000 worth of airfares, all the hotel accommodation was non-refundable, you know, and I'd been telling everyone I was going to go. And I kept saying to myself, if I don't give up, I can't fail. I don't have to do this now. I, if, as long as I keep working my way towards it, gave myself some compassion, had a few beers with my mates, and talked about it, which is, you know, the more I talked about it, the better I felt. And I didn't put any pressure on myself. And a couple of months later, I found my mojo again, my back healed, and I started running, and then I went and did the 777. But this brings me to my last point about never, ever giving up. If you don't give up, you can't fail you're always moving towards that goal. Sometimes you're moving fast, sometimes you're moving slow. So this was the, um, the footage of me just before I broke my back and on the first year, and I'm running as fast as I can at 17,000 feet because the um, camera's on me. It wasn't that fast the whole way. <laughs> and then I wanted to make a film for young people about overcoming this fear of failure. You know, the fear of failure has killed more dreams than failure ever has. Not trying, that's the only failure. So I went back and I took a film crew with me and I was going to run this thing again. And then the, um, when we got there, the largest dump of snow in living memory happened about two weeks before we got there, so it was quite an issue for us. But we managed to do it. So 
it's available free of charge on Vimeo and a whole lot of schools send their kids home um, uh, to just do a little project on it as well. Now, before I um, finish, I'm going to just tell you a quick story. Out of, um, I managed to write a book a couple of years ago. It started off that I was writing it for my kids, and it got a bit bigger. And when I was working for Great Barrier Airlines, uh, this is probably 20, almost 25 years ago, I had a job to fly to America and bring the small aircraft home. And it was a twin otter airplane, which is about a 21-seater, um, weighs about 12 tonne. And we picked it up in Texas. Uh, the French pilots had flown it up from the Caribbean. And we flew it from Texas all the way over to um, San Francisco, where the aircraft was going to be tanked. And what, that, what that meant is the airplane was designed to fly 300 miles with fuel tanks. Uh, so we, the engineers pulled all the seats out of it, and they put huge, five huge big fuel tanks inside this aircraft um, so we could fly 2,100 miles from San Francisco to Honolulu. All the appropriate checks were done. Uh, FAA signed it off, everything was done properly. Uh, we got airborne, everything was going really well until we got past halfway. And then the fuel from the ferry system inside the aircraft uh, tanks started flowing really slowly to the point where it wouldn't keep up with the demand of the engines. So I crawled out of the, uh, the co pilot seat and I crawled across the top of these tanks. And there was about a, a, um, an 18 inch gap, but the tanks filled up their whole aircraft. Got to the back and I cut the fuel lines at the back and I started transferring fuel from this back tank which seemed to have more gas in it, uh, to the front tanks and these big uh, drink containers. And I started doing this for a couple of hours. We couldn't keep up with the demand of the engines. It was no good. The thing that saved us is we asked for help early. So we put out a mayday call. And the Americans sent out uh, two F-15 fighters from Honolulu. And they could find us on their lookdown shoot down radar. Uh, they sent out a C-130 Hercules. And there was some other uh, battleship that changed direction to relay comms for us as well. So we had some amazing equipment. It's a pretty good place to crash in America. Um, had some amazing equipment. Uh, but these F-15 fighters turned up next to us, and they couldn't change anything. They couldn't give us more fuel. And in fact, the Hercules turned up, and this aircraft is a um, twin auto, so it's a fixed undercarriage. The undercarriage is fixed down. It's a stole aircraft, a short takeoff and landing aircraft. And this Hercules turns up. And the um, guy introduces himself, and he says, oh, it's uh, Colonel Dave Palmer, I think his name was. He said, um, we were called November 37 Sierra Tango. He goes, November 37 Sierra Tango, you must retract your undercarriage. If you don't retract your undercarriage, you have no chance of survival. And I clicked the mic and said, oh, it's welded down. It's fixed. We can't retract it. And it was just silence. It was a really bad thing to say for someone who's trying to help. <laughs> anyway, I got into the, the front seat. And because uh, it was no good, we couldn't keep up with the demand of the engines at all. So I got into the front, and the skipper looked at me, and he goes, he's a mate of mine, and he goes, what are you doing here? He said, go down the back. We've already discussed this. Your position in this emergency is down the back. But he was my mate, and I couldn't live with myself if I um, watched him do it. So I said, I'm staying, but I've got to do one thing. I've got to write a note to my girlfriend. And I started, got the pen out, and I started this little note, and I put it down my underpants. It's a weird thing to do, I know. And he, go, he looked at me, and he goes, what did you do that for? And I said, oh, if they find my body, they're going to find my last words. And he knew what I meant because we knew that there was 1,000 people who died off that coast, 350 aircraft, no one had ever survived, and our chances were zero. And he said, that's a great idea. You fly, and I'm going to do the same. So we had no autopilot, so I'm flying from this side. And he's sitting there with his pen, and he's sort of writing, and he looks up, and he looks at me, and he goes, well, what did you write? <laughs> And we sort of laughed, and then I think at that stage we were running on one engine. No, we were running on two engines, and both engines flamed out, and we started to glide, and it's pitch black at night, and we managed to start the engines on another tank, but we were running on fumes. The last thing I'd done is I dipped the tanks before we got into the cockpit, and I reckon we had three hours of fuel, uh, the, and we were one hour offshore, and the independent investigation reckons we had two hours 50, but we just couldn't access it. So we started both engines again. The Hercules pulled in front of us, and it dropped flares out the back of the, air, of the um, aircraft onto the water. And we came down behind them. And I'd pull my window down, and I'd had my head out. And I'm just waving Alistair down, the skipper down. And he's just looking at my hands, just checking forward. And then I looked up, and there was pitch black sea, one flare, and then pitch black sky. And to actually uh, get depth perception, you need two flares. So you can see where you are. Otherwise, it's just one flare with everything black around it. So I shouted, go around. There's only one flare. He knew exactly what I meant. And I pushed the thrust levers up. 
and we turned, but everything was going wrong. We had um, no shoulder harnesses. We had a one-off dispensation from Civil Aviation New Zealand to bring this aircraft into uh, New Zealand with no ha proper harnesses, just little lap belts. And so we knew we were going to hit our heads on the dash and get knocked out and, and drowned. So what we'd done is we'd jacked the doors open with our boots, so hopefully the doors would snap off and that we could somehow cushion the impact or get out. And his door flew open and his boot fell out and it slammed shut. So he goes, quick, I've lost my, my door shut, I've lost my boot, you fly. So I'm trying to fly from this side, but there's no altimeter on my side. There's only an altimeter on his. So I'm trying to fly between the zero and the one around the corner, lined it back up, can't see anything outside, it's completely black. And then the, the flare path was there, we swapped control again, and then put my head back out and I waved them down. And this time there's three or four flares and I looked at him. And this time I could smell the water, it was that close, and it was pitch black and scary. And I looked at him and screamed at him, we've got to do it. And he said, I know. And I, we shouted at each other. And then he grabbed the thrust levers and he closed them. And as he did that, I pulled both the fuel shutoffs and then I feathered the propellers, which means I, I turned them into the, uh, uh, the slipstream so that they stopped. And then I pulled both the fire extinguishers and fired them into the engines. Just as so I did that, we hit. And the aircraft hit the water. And then the cockpit got driven into the water by about 20 feet and stayed there and the tail sticking straight up. Everything went in slow motion. My um, seat snapped, it was a 25G seat and it broke and it crushed me into the control column. All my clothes got blown off in the impact. My jaw got locked open and my head got forced back and I remember swallowing and swallowing and swallowing water so I couldn't swallow any more water and I was scrabbling for my focus point but everything had changed and I remember just cutting my hands just trying to get out and then right at, uh, this probably went on for about 45 seconds and the aircraft sat sitting there and a really calm thought came across my mind that if I just relaxed and took this huge breath of water into my lungs, then I'd be at peace. And I wasn't scared, which is really funny. It was, it was like I'd already come to terms with it in that millisecond. And just as I relaxed and took this huge big breath, the aircraft actually popped out of water and there was about two inches left in the cockpit for us to breathe and I took this huge breath. I looked at Alistair and he's looking at me and we sort of fired out of the, um, fired out of the aircraft and started swimming around. And then normally in those high-wing aircraft, um, both the engines come into the cockpit and kill both pilots. And as I jumped out, the engine propeller was right next to my seat, just sort of clipping on my seat. And so I got out. Um, I swam around the back. Just make sure I'm not going over time, sorry. Got around the back and I got in a couple of times, uh, but it was just getting too dangerous. It was something like out, out of an Indiana Jones movie. So we got into the life raft, and we had this little tiny life raft about this big, and our entire training for the life raft was, here's the life raft, it cost $10,000, don't lose it. That was it. <laughs> so we, um, it opened up, and it was about half the size of your table, and it was supposed to fit um, four of us in for three days. Uh, we got on it, the Coast Guard dropped some more life rafts, so we paddled to one of those, and then they sent out a little tender, and this little boat came out, um, from this, sorry, we got into the life rafts and about an hour later a huge container ship turned up and we signalled it with our, with our torches and they sent out this little tender and the tender turned up and they were German crew, they were really nice and they put us in, they didn't talk to us very much, they took us back to the ship, um, I saw my underpants on so I was quite lucky and the, um, they chucked a rope ladder over the side and those container ships are huge, about 100 feet high and I the guy in this, uh, the German guy said, climb the ladder and be careful because the tender's going to come back in the swell and it's going to kill you if you don't do it quickly. I remember thinking, great, after all this, I'm going to get killed in my undies. <laughs> and so I grabbed hold of the rope that I didn't need to be told twice, climbed up, and I collapsed onto the floor. And a very shiny pair of shoes sort of appeared in front of my eyes, and I'm shaking, I'm in sort of shock. And it was a German first, first mate. And he picked me up, and his accent, he goes, uh, welcome to the Columbus, Canada. Where are you from? And I went, oh, thank you so much. I'm, we're from New Zealand. And he goes, ah, you're a Kiwi. We've rescued heaps of you Kiwis. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think it, and he had it rescued heaps of yachts. And as a nation, I think we just get out and give it a go, which is so cool. So I came home, uh, went round to my mum's house. And my mum's a really wise lady. Um, she was a, she's a psychotherapist, or she was a psychotherapist. And she said to me, she goes, Mike, I know you're going to fly again. And the best piece of advice, she goes, if you have an incident and you're not scared because you think you're too cool because you crashed this plane, you've got post-traumatic stress, you need to come and see me. And I went, okay, fair enough. And really good advice. And then she said, you're a mess, go and have a bath. And it's the first time I sat in this bath in her house, and as a, as a young man, I was probably 23 or 24, I just let myself dream. And I just remember dreaming about wanting a life full of adventure. 
And sometimes you've got to be careful what you wish for because um, I wanted to fly in those days in jungles and a couple of months later I was flying a, a small aeroplane up in Fiji in the jungles around there and I had a big engine failure and a busted undercarriage and I was really scared so I was also quite normal which is another good thing. But that brings me nicely around to summarise about why dreaming is so important. The more you dream, the more refined your ideas become and then you find your passion. Finding that passion is so important, it really is. If you want to achieve anything, you think super hard or impossible. It wasn't until I worked out I hated running. I still don't like running. But running was my vehicle to get the adventure. Everything fell into place. It really did. Once you know what you want to do, the next thing is get this plan. Write it down straight away and break it into small parts and smaller and smaller and smaller so that when you get overwhelmed, every, all of us get overwhelmed, you can take these tiny steps and then you'll find this momentum. And the momentum is magic. Off you go. And the last one is just never, ever give up. If you don't give up, you can't fail. If you ever want some inspiration, go and have a look at what Mr. Honda did years ago, trying to, trying to get his motorbikes um, up and his car company up. It's incredible. Just never, ever give up. You can't fail. I want to leave, would like to leave you with one last thought, and it's this, that we are limited only by the limitations that we set upon ourselves. Now think about this. I'm the perfect example. You know, for a start, we all have our own Everests inside of us, you know, and not a lot of them uh, include a mountain. So I set my limit at climbing Everest, and I'd never climbed a mountain before. If I'd set my limit at one marathon, I would have achieved it, but I didn't. I had that courage, and that's the big thing, is having that courage um, to set my limit sky high, which for me was seven marathons, seven days on seven continents. And if you can find the courage with what you do personally in your lives and with your Everest, you'll be absolutely amazed at what you can achieve. And once you've achieved something you thought was impossible or really difficult, it comes down to this, that you develop a whole new set of personal beliefs, and those personal beliefs allow you to go on and, and achieve greater and greater things. And at the end of the day, it just comes down to a few little words, and it's this, that if you believe you can do it, then you will. Thank you very much, everybody. I'd like to wish you all the best.